Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, Labor will be supporting this bill. I am a little bit surprised, Mr Speaker, because the um, Residential Tenancy Amendment Bill, the original one, the first one, came to the Social Services Select Committee and this one's going to another Select Committee. I was just talking to my colleague Phil Twyford about why that might be and perhaps they're trying to avoid our housing spokesperson by sending it to another Select Committee. Uh, Mr Speaker, well, we'll send him in that direction uh, when the bill is being considered so that it can um, get some good Phil Twyford housing analysis going on there. And we will be selecting the bill. There's, there's a number of changes. However, there are three that we deem as being most important uh, in this bill. First, it will give landlords easier access to their properties to test for methamphetamine contamination and would allow the landlord or the tenant to terminate a tenancy if tests come back at unsafe levels. The bill also sets up a regulation making power to set the standards and guidelines for meth testing, including a maximum acceptable level of, a, a, of contamination and guidelines for testing. Mr Speaker, we've been going on about this for quite some time. It is long overdue. Nationals Housing Minister Nick Smith has allowed for far too long a cowboy testing industry to run riot for the last few years without any proper regulation. Tenants and landlords, understandably concerned about meth contamination, haven't had reliable standards or testing for the last few years. Housing New Zealand, along, uh, ha along with that, has wasted about $30 million on meth testing and decontamination and has evicted more than 500 tenants unnecessarily on the basis of faulty testing that has been unable to prove whether there is residue that could be at risk to the health of tenants. Tenants have been evicted on the basis of meth residue being evicted, but without baseline testing, there is no reliable proof that they were responsible for some earlier tenant. So it is really another Nick Smith fiasco, Mr Speaker. The bill's provisions are long overdue, but they are unlikely to be effective without some regulation of the meth testing and decontamination industry. The second point to make about why we're uh, supporting this bill and um, the second area that's uh, of primary interest to us is that it clarifies some laws around where the tenant is liable for damage to a rental premises um, broadly encompassed by intentional damage by a tenant or damage which was caused by a tenant as a result of an act that constitutes an imprisonable offence. It also clarifies that tenants are responsible for damage caused by a guest of the tenant, i.e. someone that has been given permission on the premises as opposed to a gate crasher or intruder. The law and practice around the liability of tenants for careless or intentional damage to a rental property was changed by the court judgment in Holler v Osaki. The bill tries to set out a new balance of rights and responsibilities for both landlords and tenants. This is a complex area and we're looking forward to hearing from the Property Investors Federation and Tenants Advocacy Groups at Select Committee so we can try to craft a solution that is workable and fair for both parties. Thirdly, it strengthens the law for prosecuting landlords who have rented out unsuitable accommodation such as garages, warehouses and industrial buildings. However, given National's seeming reliance on housing people and garages due to their complete inaction on the housing crisis, it seems at odds they are willing to do this. Mr Speaker, we will be supporting this bill to Select Committee. Uh, the three issues that I have outlined are worth getting sorted out. But the strange thing is that with half of all Kiwis living in rental housing, there is so much more that National should be doing to fix a broken market, rental market. Mr Speaker, I see it all the time in my electorate of Calston, um, where constituents are paying through the nose for substandard accommodation. I saw one recently where a family were homeless and living in their car and then put into emergency accommodation and then forced to take up the one house that they were able to actually be rented uh, because the landlord said, OK, I'll give the house to you. And with, um, in the first three weeks, Mr Speaker, they had uh, two issues with the sewage, that where sewage was spilling out onto the 
uh, on the driveway, a landlord who was very slow to respond. They were told that the house was four bedrooms, but they got there and one of the bedrooms was actually the lounge. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the, the house wasn't insulated, it was cold, there were no smoke alarms, there was a whole lot of rubbish that was left, left behind from the previous tenants that the landlord hadn't fixed up, a whole lot that was broken when they moved in, Mr Speaker, and a landlord that had no intention of fixing any of that up. And really, as a consequence of the housing crisis, what we have here is uh, landlords who are cowboys, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, who are exploiting the housing crisis, who have no qualms with uh, exploiting desperate people in desperate situations, and uh, Mr. Speaker, without the, right, without the right checks and measures in place, that will only continue and unfortunately get worse. Mr. Speaker, we do need a much broader plan to be able to address this, and we've come up with a number of things that we will do, and we um, would implore the, the government to do. So we have said that we will legislate to improve standards for rentals to make sure they are all warm and dry. Andrew Little's Healthy Homes Bill will be back in the House shortly for its second reading. It would be great if the national government would pay attention to that. Mr Speaker, we will be massively increasing the supply of housing. Uh, as, as, as we've said through our uh, Kiwi Build policy, and that will flow on to um, increase the supply of rental properties, Mr Speaker. Uh, so with that, hopefully then we don't have so many people in desperate situations and then landlords willing to then uh, exploit them, not only through substandard uh, living conditions, but also through um, rents that are completely disproportionate to what they are renting in terms of the amount that they're paying. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have to address the property speculation issue, and we have said that we will be curbing that, um, and we will be closing down the speculators' tax loophole and banning foreign buyers from buying existing homes. I can't see why the government has such an issue with that. When you go out onto the street and you speak to the public and you tell them, actually, we're going to stop non-New Zealand residents, uh, non-New Zealand citizens from being able to purchase properties in New Zealand, they breathe a sigh of relief and they look at you and, well, that's just common sense. Why wouldn't the government do that? But for some reason, that side of the House finds it so difficult um, and can't even contemplate being able to, uh, to ban foreign speculation, Mr Speaker. And we do need to look at the issues around security of tenure uh, and the right to make a house a home. Mr Speaker, we have far too much transience with regards to our, our children. In fact, we come across schools where they say they've got like a 30 per cent turnover of students. And the reality is that comes down to the fact that their parents don't have stable housing. And so if they are in rental properties and there's no security of tenure, they can't afford to buy a house and they're constantly getting shifted on, then what kind of disruption does that cause uh, to the education of those children, Mr Speaker, and the schools are telling us it's, it's causing a huge disruption. So it is about healthy homes, it's about making sure that those kids are well, but also about giving that, that, them that sense of stability in the house and also in the neighbourhood, in the community and in the school, so that they don't have to constantly shift. Mr Speaker, moreover, much of the debate on this bill is likely to end up on new changes to meth contamination standards. And changes are good, however, what would be better is National actually showing some guts on methamphetamine supply in New Zealand, and then we'd have to worry less about it being smoked in our homes. Mr Speaker, I will not forget that one of the first things they did was remove the pseudoephedrine from our cough medicines and our chemists, Mr Speaker, and what kind of impact did that have on the meth problem in this country? None. It has gone up every year significantly under their watch, Mr Speaker. It's cheaper and easier to access than ever before. It's, it's cheaper and easier to access than ever before. And what's more, since Bill English got into the Prime Minister's office, he's put the DPMC reporting on the meth action plan on ice, Mr Speaker. That's not leadership. New Zealanders want to see something done about this issue. So far, they've seen nothing. And the only thing they've seen from that side of the government is the removal of cough medicines that actually help alleviate the symptoms, um, but nothing to actually alleviate the meth problem in this country, Mr Speaker. We need some action, and unfortunately the reality is, I think, well actually, no, not unfortunately, fortunately, the only way New Zealand is going to see real action 
as if they changed the government on September 23rd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I haven't called the member yet. Oh, it's just anticipation. Is the member just going to call in the traditional way? Mr. Speaker. Matt Doosan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.